Okay, we'll do a share screen. Uh, share. I don't know, it's not sharing what I expect. Stop sharing, okay. Okay, share. How do I select the, the, the window that I want to share? It had started sharing a minute ago. Can you see something? Nope, just you. No. It's coming. It's it's just slow. There you go. Can you see it? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. That's this is on iNaturalist, okay. It's a nice little mushroom there, but I'm not positive about the identification. Okay, so it's pretty small. You can see my finger here. Another picture. Yeah, that's probably what that is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Right. A little dry. Certainly out. neophobalous. Okay, so everybody agrees on this. You agree on the species too? Avalaris, yeah, that's, yeah, Aviolaris. There's, there's a couple of new species that have been named, but the, this one is probably the classic Aviolaris. The color, the cap color. Is. I thought that Alveolaris is not in North America. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Shows how far we are behind naming. <laughs> Luke, Luke, you know a little bit about this, right? I, I just know that they just keep saying, people are just saying that there's probably a species complex or, uh, I'm not sure about Alveolaris not being North American. That, Quite possibly could be true. Yeah, I haven't heard that. I've heard of um, Neofabulus americana, which which I actually, one of my observations is something that I'm going to suggest might be that species. Um, but but I, I my understanding is that that's not, has not yet at least supplanted Lars in North America, but there just might be a stand alone species. Right, a different species. Okay, next one. No, not this one, this one. It's also a very small mushroom, you know, like the size of a, of a quarter maybe. Maybe smaller. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, can you see it now? Yes, yep, yeah. <laughs> Is it really as bright orange as the first picture? Yes. 
but this is like taken from under, you know, the light is going through, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see the inside pigments, I guess. If, so I see that the one cap here on top has got some scales um, on the cap near where it attaches to the substrate. Um, and the one that's on the bottom looks like it might be a little more scaly than that one. Yeah. Is, is that the case? Because cro crocophilus, uh, Crepidotus crocophilus is pretty, it's, I think the whole cap is pretty much scaly. I, I'd have to refresh my memory on that. It but, looked... Um, it looked very fresh to me. It looked very, very fresh. No, so maybe talking, I mean the scales. The scales. Maybe it doesn't cap. get, but maybe it doesn't get scaly immediately. Maybe no, no, it's scaly. When it dries up. Cro cro Crocophyllus is scaly. Yeah. Um, pretty much from the start, or or if not, maybe maybe it starts out like brownish and then breaks apart into scales. I don't. That's another thing I would. I would need to refresh my memory on this. Is, this is almost certainly a crepidotus. Did you get a spore print color on this? No. Yeah. Well, at, I, even without a spore print color, I'd say you're pretty safe with saying this is genus crepidotus. Um, there are a few crepidotus species that are not that difficult to ID. Crocophyllus is um, I'm one of them. Um, I'm not sure this is it. I'd have to, to review it. Um, but did, did you post this someplace like iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer or anything like that? Yeah, it's an iNaturalist. Yeah, I, I have to start looking at iNaturalist more. I, I use Mushroom Observer all the time. Um, uh, yeah. But, but yeah, that, that's just me, though. You know, if I want to look at this, I'll just have to, you know, uh, incorporate yet another website into my mushroom um, <laughs> observations. Um, but yeah, you've, you've got a crepidotus here. That, I'm pretty sure of that. Okay. And by the way, if you really want to know if you've got a crepidotus as opposed to uh, any of a variety of other sort of, um, you know, stockless or, or virtually stockless um, fruit bodies found on wood, then just take a spore print. Um, Crepidotus mm -hmm. spores are always brown. Okay. Okay. Dorothy would call the shape petaloid, like the petal of a flower. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is another one I cannot. Uh, I was not able to identify. Okay, no, it's not this one. It's not this one. Not this one. No. Maybe this one here. No. Okay. I hope this is this one. Sorry about the data text. Uh, Come on. No, okay. I'm gonna let's go for with this one. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Some kind of pluteus, maybe, huh? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, if the gills are truly free, it looks like they are from this yes. photo. Yeah, they look like it. Yeah. Otherwise, I would suggest maybe sarsaparilla. But um, anyway, yeah, that that that's going to be a key ingredient, and the spore print color as well. Plutius have tannish pink spore print. <laughs> That's the same mushroom? Yeah, that's the same one. Satharel, yeah. Candelomyces, Candelo. Oh, I'm sorry. Candelo. Oh, they just changed the name. Candelomyces candelonianus. There it is. Yep. I may have not accented the syllables correctly, but that's what that is. It, it's, a, it's what used to be called Satharella candeliana. You see the hanging from the cap margin here, the little bits of material hanging from the cap margins? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. part of a partial veil that you're not going to find in virtually any Pluteus species, except for a very rare um, uh, veiled species that they get in the Midwest in like Missouri, <laughs> like one place in Missouri. But um, this this is um, what used to be called Satharella candelianum. And what's a new name now? Um, um, Candelomyces candelonianus. I'm, so I'm trying to pr pronounce phonetically. You know, I don't mm -hmm. really know how to pronounce all the, these Latin words, but uh, I think there's two N's in there, Maricel, if you're doing the, the, the um, spelling there. There, there should be an H in there. Or two L's. I don't know. Double consonants. What's what's the point of double consonants? I never figured that out. Yeah, but, um, and so anyway, um, um, there's a double consonant in there someplace. It might be two L's. It might be two N's. I forget. Yeah, that's that that's pretty close, Marisol. Um, if you do it, if you do a Google search on that, you're gonna find you're gonna find this. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lauren did that. Lauren wrote the name. Okay. Oh, Lauren. Oh, I'm sorry, Lauren. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that's that's good enough to. There might be one or two letters to correct there, but you'll find it online. Okay, very good. Okay, I'm done. Okay, thanks, Sarah. All right, Lauren, you want to go next? Sure. Hi. I, go I had to Google that Candelomyces because I'm wondering if that's what I found. I'll show you photos. I'm kind of curious if that's the same thing or not. Oh, oh by the way, Lauren, um, I need to affirm your um, claim to having found, oh, well, there it is. <laughs> yeah, there um, it is. Amanita muscaria last week because that, that, that looks like what you've got there. It's not Praycox. Um, the other one was a little yellower, though. I know um, Lauren sent me an email with it with a picture, and it it certainly looked oh, like um, Amanita muscaria radicus. So yeah, yeah, and that's the Candelomyces. Yeah, there's the one you sent me. There it is, too orange, and and the warts too small and too pointed for um, Praycox. And uh, muscaria is also an early um, occurring Amanita. Praycox is usually first. In, in, in section Amanita, but Muscaria is generally pretty early. Um, yeah, the other. I can't see anything. <laughs> Dave, you muted yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, and I was just waiting for it to show the next picture because I, I, I believe it is Candelomyces, Candelianus. <laughs> I don't know, too many syllables there for me to handle. Um, all at once, but uh, I'm a better speller than I am a speaker, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> but that's what that is. That's the same thing that who was it, Harv, uh, a little while ago showed. Same species. Okay. All right, yeah, yeah, these it's pretty variable. I, I would like to see the undersides, you know, just for they're going to be white to begin with, but they'll they'll darken and you'll get a dark spore print, like a grayish, purplish, um, uh, brown, a pretty dark print. Yeah, that's what that is. See, they're white to begin. These are young ones. Um, but but when the spores darken, the gills darken also. Do you see the remnants hanging from the margins of the caps? Yeah. That's the yeah. veil. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is very common. I usually find it at least once or twice every spring, uh, mid, the, mid spring. The gills are very thin in proportion to the cap and the rest of it. And also- Yeah, that sounds right kind of too. Yeah, the mulching, gills are not very broad. Mulching mm -hmm. wood chips, um, which in this case were probably below the grass. Yeah, I find these on lawns quite often, actually. They, they're, they're not very picky about where they grow. They, you're not going to find them like directly on stumps or, or logs, but uh, wherever there is enough sort of vegetable matter for them to get some sort of nutrients, they, they could show up. And they're often very uh, clustered, like you're showing in the other picture. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes yeah. singly, sometimes just one, sometimes in clusters. Yeah, they're, it's a pretty variable uh, species, really. Okay, cool. Yeah, this was in my yard, so uh, it's cool to know what they actually are. At first glance, I thought maybe they were mica caps, and then I went over to them and I thought, okay, they're they're too big. They're kind of lighter in color. Um, you know, they didn't have the, um, uh, what do you call it? Those things. <laughs> Variations? Um, no, like the... Um, Oh, the, the universal snacks. veil remnants, the, the yeah. mica, mica flakes. Yeah. So, yeah, there was a lot of stuff different. Um, but at first, now, that's what I thought this could be. Um, but, now, mica, yeah, caps will, mica caps will lose the, the, the little mica flecks sometimes when it rains. But one major difference is going to be um, Copernellus mycaceus um, group. There's like two or three species in the group. The caps are pretty strongly striate, and the yeah. striate, striations are fairly long. These guys have either very faint striations that are not very long, or not striate at all on the caps. Yeah. Okay. This is a good example, though, of also waiting till one is mature before you can really tell what the spores are going to be. Those are very white gills, but when it's older, it will be dark to purpley black, if I remember. Okay. Show you. So um, I naturalist actually told me what this was, um, which I now I'm for, it was some kind of copernopsis. Um, Can I guess? Can I guess yeah. what they said? Sure, yeah. Scenario? Scenario? Um, it says Lana Tule. Lana Tule. Oh, that's a different one. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. And the picture that they show, I mean, you know, who knows, but the picture that they show matches exactly. Um, this was at Spruce Run Reservoir. These were really neat. I've never seen these before. But yeah, they were cool. Could, could Do you know how to spell that name? That sounds like a pretty good one. I'd, I'd like to. Um, I will put it in the chat. Okay, thanks. And also, if it notes who's the identifier that suggested that name, I'd be interested. Oh, uh, let me take a look. How about uh, Caprinellus vagopus? What? What about Caprinellus vagopus? I don't know. No, no lagopus. Too hairy. It's lighter. Vagopus yeah, lighter. lighter like yeah. A, like well, it's very young, so uh, you have to look at the, all the stages of development for that. The pictures yeah. of the older Vagopus that I see are similar to this. Oh, actually, do I have that? Oh, here. This, I think this. Oh, is that something else? Sorry. No, uh, that's the same. They just know a quest. Yeah, that's that's. I'd say that's probably the same thing. Just like a day or so older. Um, does anybody know who? Mich I don't know how this is pronounced. Michelle Beekman. That's who um, I did it on iNaturalist. Mike, Michael Beekman? Um, it says M-I-C-H-E-L. Yeah, I don't know if that's another weird way of saying Michael. <laughs> I think it's Michael Beekman. He's from York. But he's a pretty good identifier. Okay. If it's, if it's who I think, I think it is. Well, I, I think Vagopus should be considered because once you go online and Google and you type the name, you'll see that your mushroom looks very similar to Vagopus in Google, unless those are misidentifications. <clears throat> Igor, how do you spell that? Vagopus, L-A-G-O-P-U-S. But there are few that are very similar, so you have to know the spore size 
to the go to the species. Yeah, you might want to also check uh, out Scenaria, or is it Scenaria? La, la Naturae, something like I that. I can't tell the difference between the male and the female species. <laughs> Apparently, that the picture, is the, it does look similar. That that is the, the distinction in Latin whether you end the species name in an A or a U.S. And of course, this makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, but apparently, it makes sense to some people. But um, scenario, scenarios, not sure which is the ending. You might want to check that one out, too. But this looks a little different to me, honestly. The young stage, to me, looks a little bit different than either scenario or Legopus. So um, interesting find and nice picture on that, on those buttons. Lauren, Lauren yes. there is a, a group. Michael, I think it's Michael Bigman. He um, identifies coprinoid fungi. It's called, this looks like a jab for Michael Bigman. This, this looks like a what? <laughs> this looks like a jab for Michael Bigman. Oh. He identifies all these mushrooms the coprinoids and the parasola and coprinellus and all of those. Well, he is the one who I did it on iNaturalist for me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but Igor, I'm looking at the photos of the um, uh, Lagopus and the difference I'm seeing, the, the young ones look very similar to what I found, but the older ones um, that are pictured don't look like they're deliquescing. Like it looks like they aged yeah, differently. They don't. They don't. Now the deliquescence is variable and it depends on atmospheric conditions. Oh, okay. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. We have this discussion before. Remember that there is a group yeah. that really deliquescent, like the, um, the one that the, uh, the ink, what's the one that they cannot drink alcohol? That's Altramentarius. The Oprinus, for real, they, they, they drop black stuff. The other ones, they don't do the, the complete. They, they, they can't, they can, Marisol. It depends on the atmospheric conditions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. The Copernopsis, okay. the, the one that's, the only one that's really reliably going to turn to ink all the time is Coprinus commodus, the shaggy mane. That one will almost always turn into black ink. The other ones, it's variable. But you, on, the, on the picture, it looks really woolly, right? Yeah. It looks like wool. And uh, the, the species Lanatus, it means woolly in Latin. This, this is a different mushroom. No, the one yeah, we had before. Is, this is Lacry Maria. But there's a few different species. This, okay, this looks that. like what used okay. to be Satharella velutina. That's a different yeah, one. Yeah, it's now Lacry Maria, and there's like split into like three different species. You have a picture of the underside. Um, I do, and I'm I'm just want to Google this real quick so I don't lose it. Um, I'm sorry. Can you spell that the genus? What it is? L a c r y, m a r, i a. It's phonetic, okay. and there's no double consonants. Lacry Maria, something to do with tears, eh? Yes, because it weeps. Sometimes the margin of the yeah. cap will have veil remnants hanging down like tears, but not always. But but that the, my understanding is that's the um, the origin of, of um, it because used to be, it was, as Susan said, it was um, Satharella velutina, then it was Satharella lacri Maria, Maria, and now it's lac, lac Maria is the genus. And there's more than one species. The most common is lacri Maria, lacri Mabunda. And that's also phonetic, well, luckily. Um, but there's another couple of species as well. Ridge, um, oh, Ridge of something or other, R-I-D-G. And, and but the characters to note, the characters to, the characters to note, you see that kind of shaggy stem, you see little remnants of the spore color and, and some of that uh, tissue that was on the edge of the cap on the stem up high. The black, yeah. And, see, and the little bits of remnants, sort of his tears, he was saying, black business at the edge of the margin, the edge of the cap. 
And then that surface on the cap from your first picture is very distinctive. And also the color of the gills is quite interesting, but the spore print's gonna be almost black, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Susan. On the, on the upper stipe, you can see a black deposit. Yeah. It's 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 either black or it's like so close to black that it's really yeah. hard to tell. But it's, but you notice the gills are are still somewhat brown. But also your mushroom is not fully extended out, so it's 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 maturing the spores, but they're not quite all dropped. But your wood chips habitat is another thing for this thing. Okay. Um, combination of all of these features, you know. Um, are Nina and John around? Because oh, I think this is Nina's favorite or one of her favorites. Um, this shows up in the same spot in my neighborhood every single year. Um, I, I don't know agaricus well at all. I, I never find them other than these ones that grow um, around the corner. Um, I think last year Nina said these were horse mushrooms. Um, but I went through like the agaricus features and they kind of confuse me. I don't know what anise smells like. So I have no idea what I'm smelling when I'm smelling it. So that's not helpful. <laughs> um, but I did scratch it. It stained yellow, but it was very subtle. It wasn't a bright yellow. Well, your agaricus is not a, an easy genus to identify anything in. Um, rich carrot. Yeah, but this one looks. This one looks like you can put it into section Arvenses, which is the so-called horse mushrooms. And, and why the, do you say well that? Well-defined annular uh, annulus, which if you can get a close-up on that annulus, if it's if it's got like, if it's yeah. like divided into little sections, so yeah. this one looks a little different here. These um, are these are the the underside of the smaller ones. Yeah. Do you have the under a close up of the underside of the bigger one? Because they probably um, are all the same. It's oh oh I'm sorry, duh. Look look on the outer part of the partial veil. Um on, on the picture you just showed. Okay. Yeah, go back to the picture you just showed. Okay, look on the outer part. You see these like yellow scales? Yeah. On the um so if this partial veil had formed an annulus rather than sticking to the cap margin, those little scales would have formed the distinctive cog wheel annulus um, that most um, of the species in section Arvenses um, will show. Section Arvenses is like a technical way of saying horse mushroom. So there's a Garagus arvensis, there's a Garagus crocodile. I think the crocophyllinus or something like that. Um, uh, you have to measure the spores to really tell the difference. But, but mm -hmm. for general purposes, if you can get us the mushroom into section arvenses, you know that's 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 pretty good, and and they're good edibles, you know, and they do smell nice. Uh, odor odor is um, you know something to try to take note of. Um, would, I would not eat any agaricus that I wasn't absolutely sure of the identification. Yes, I, agree. I, I agree with Susan. The only reliable uh, way to ID agaricus is through DNA, period. And also yeah. send it to Rick Kerrigan out in Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, 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 but you, don't, you don't need to know, for instance, is it arvenses or crocophyllinus in order to know if it's edible. Well, even, you do even, sections, even sections are not that easy, you know. I mean, this thing could be staining yellow and it could be a sickener. Well, I didn't eat it. Yeah, but it's, um, not, one, it's not one of those. It's, I, this is not xanthodermis or... Um, I wouldn't be so sure. Uh, I wouldn't be so sure. You're doing uh, well okay. to get it to agaricus for sure. Yeah, it's definitely agaricus. <laughs> I really agree. I agree. Well, that's because of Nina last year. <laughs> It's a very hard genus to, to get any species from. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, like, because if they are a choice edible, I see them every year and uh, oh. <laughs> I just look at them and, you know, I pick them and I take pictures of them and show them to you guys. Um, it's, you know, it'd be nice to try them one day, but no, I don't eat anything. I'm not sure of, you know, I'd have one of you guys see it in person before it was. You know, there is a guy who really likes agaricus, and he wrote a book that's about an inch and a half thick, and they're all white agaricus, pretty much. In that oh my god! At least an inch and a half thick. 
Huh? At least an inch and a half thick. <laughs> yeah, at least an inch. That's and probably half. that's probably more like two and a half inches. You have that book. Luke? Yeah, yeah, but it's tough to use. You make any sense out of it? Not really. The, the guy is very nice. The Kerrigan book. If you yeah, and if if you actually have good pictures and good collection and a good spore print, you know he, he might answer you. He he's interested in what's growing where, but you know. Yeah, I sent some. I sent some stuff to Rick Kerrigan last summer, or last fall actually, uh, but he's not really. He's retired now. He doesn't really want. He doesn't have access to, you know, oh, to um, DNA funded stuff. DNA sequences and so forth. So, um, but um, yeah, it, yeah, getting a Garrigus to species is ridic it's ridiculously hard, really. Um, but but you can you can get them to section sometimes, and you can learn to avoid the bad ones. There are some bad ones. Um, there actually aren't that many bad ones that are, that are in Eastern North America, and they are relatively easy to identify. Um, but you have to, uh, uh, to identify to a group. Um, you have to be able to smell them, though. That's actually a, a key feature. Yeah, I mean, um, when I did smell it, to me, it was kind of in between decent and not not great so but it was it was subtle it wasn't anything like really obviously bad but um yeah i wasn't sure what to make of the smell do, do i remember anise is a little like licorice yeah, yeah a little bit yeah. yep mm -hmm. which to me smells bad almond. So. <laughs> almond is also an odor associated with like amaretto or almond is an odor associated with um section arvenses how often do you find agaricus? Because I almost never find them. Well, I find a lot of them, and I find some of the toxic ones, and I find some of, some of the edible ones. Yeah, so, you know, as people are pointing out, it's you really have to do some research into learning, you know, how to distinguish these things at least at least in some sort of granular way, you know. So, so you know, like certain groups. Um, I would actually bet that these are section are ar vences, but you know what? Don't you know? Just because I would bet fifteen dollars that this is section ar vences, <laughs> you might not want to bet a, a trip to the ER. No, uh, no, don't worry about it. Know, I'm not so, eating them. You know. I know that they're in my fridge, so it looks like I'm going to eat them, but I'm not. Yeah, and by the way, horse mushrooms. I do collect them and I eat them. They are. They're, they're excellent, excellent edible mushrooms. But there's another thing to take into consideration with agaricus species. You should not consume agaricus species that grow in areas that have been treated with chemicals or that are near busy roadways where there might be lead deposits from years back when there was leaded gasoline. Um, agaricus mushrooms are known to uptake um, heavy metals and other undesirable um, substances. All mushrooms do that. Yeah. Yeah, Nina warned me about that last well, year. In, in particular, agaricus is, is noted uh, for this. Okay. By the way, this is a really nice picture. Oh, thanks. I'm actually looking at it now, and I'm like, you know, I could have done a better job um, getting it sharper, but I didn't want to, like, show too much in, of how dirty my refrigerator is, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and one, one, one more thing before we, we move on. You can't really see it here. Um, but agaricus mushrooms have free gills. Other dark spored mushrooms that might be confused with agaricus, like Satharella, Candelomyces, or Stropharia, have attached gills. Mm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Hey, thanks, Laura. You're welcome. Okay, is there anybody else who wants to share from their screen before I go into my emails? All right, I'm gonna put right in here then. Okay, so I think Dave, you were first. Oh, okay. 
look that chanterelle you've got in in your um avatar or whatever did you just find that no that's from a couple years ago uh because i have found chanterelles up here in a relatively cold spot as early as june 14th i, I think that was 2012 though when it was like summer and winter so uh, but I, I just wondered no i didn't but i but i we were saying before we uh, started i haven't seen much on mo a little south of us like the carolinas and stuff uh-huh so anyway we want to start here uh just take it from the top so we have a member uh, a couple of members i think they're ukrainian our, our local club uh, Sergey and and Raisa, and they were telling me that we had a, a four a.m. last Sunday, and they were telling me they picked these funnel mushrooms and ate them, and they thought they were really good. So we looked in uh, field guides and so forth, and narrowed it down to in fundulosibi. And um, so then I got kind of interested in just thinking about um, in the two main species that allegedly are found around here are. are in Fundulosibi gibba, which used to be Clytosibi gibba, um, the classic sort of funnel mushroom that's generally associated with hardwood um, uh, forest debris. It's not a mycorrhizal species. And the other one is um, in Fundulosibi squamulosa, um, which is generally associated with uh, coniferous uh, habitat. And, and so I, you know, I, I did a little looking in field guides and so forth and found out that, you know, Clytosibi. Uh, in Fundulosibi gibba is listed as edible, and I have eaten it a long time ago. I tried it out, it was pretty good, I thought. Um, but then I thought, like, what about this squamulosa thing? Is it edible? And um, most of the books say it doesn't taste good or edibility unknown. And so I thought I found it yesterday. Actually, uh, my wife went for a walk on our property, and she ran across these, and so she told me, so I went up and and got one and took some photos. So I thought, okay, this is in Fundulosibi squamulosa. Um, so that one large one that's lying down there, I ate the cap. I, of course, I fried it up pretty thoroughly first. And, um, and you know, I'm still here. Um, so, you know, I didn't get sick or anything, but, but, um, but the really interesting thing here is is this actually Infundulosibi squamulosa? Um, the spores for Infundulosibi squamulosa are supposed to be smaller than the spores for Infundulosibi uh, gibba. And what I found when I, I took, I got a nice big spore print, maybe too, too, much, too many spores really. And you know, quickly took a photo. I was pretty sure this was like a slam dunk. Okay, it's squamulosa, it's growing under these white pines. You can see all the pine needles um, in the habitat. Um, but then the spores were like really big. So I, I did a little research on this um, in Fundulosibi squamulosa. And out west, there are these two varieties that grow in conifers uh, in coniferous um, uh, settings um, what, that sometimes have large spores. And um, it, it was said that the spore size varies significantly uh, because some of them are like two spored or, um, bassidia and some are from four spored bassidia. But you can see here this picture of the spores. There's a fair amount of variation in how long and wide these spores are. Now, one problem here is that I, I took this photo of uh, through the microscope of a part of the spore print where there were probably too many spores. Or, so there might be some instances where there's like one spore lying on top of another one, and it's a little hard to tell. Um, but I, I, I did my best to estimate measurements on these spores, and quite a number of them um, were all the way up to nine microns long. And, and some of them were maybe even a little more than six microns wide, if in fact I was looking at sing single spores. And that's way out of line for Clytosibi uh, squamulosa. Uh, so this morning I got up, um, I had some appointments today, but I got up early so I can go outside and run up 
to the corner of our property where these things are growing and pick a few more of them. And so analysis is ongoing. So I'm trying to get an idea here. Do I have in fundus ivy gibba? I don't think it's that actually. Notice how the gills are sort of not crowded. They're kind of close, not real close. They're not crowded. Uh, notice how the stock is pigmented. It, that the white stuff on the stock is, I, I believe, mycelium probably. Uh, but the stock itself is pigmented. It's yellow. It's actually a little darker than the cap. Uh, and it's growing under conifers. So that's, that strongly suggests in fundulus ivy squamulosa. Um, but but the, the spores don't, don't match. The spores are only supposed to be like no, no, no longer than 7.5 microns. So, so my, my investigation into these is ongoing. I picked some more of them today. I, I've got some of them in the attic drying out. Um, and I got some more spores and I took like a whole bunch of spore pictures. Um, and I moved the, um, uh, you know, the slide around under the microscope so I can get different parts of the spore print um, through the microscope to see if in fact, are there areas where there's like some larger spores? Are they, or maybe, maybe my original photo that you just saw, maybe the spores look larger than they are supposed to look because maybe I didn't adjust the focus well enough. So ongoing. So, but it, it, I, I, to me, a pretty interesting observation for now. I mean, it might turn out to be they're just good old, um, um, in fungus ivy squamulosa. <laughs> um, at any rate, so these little guys are a big challenge. These little moss inhabiting um, spring species of gallerina. Some of them come back in the fall. Um, but these are hard to identify. And so if you want to take on a challenge, you know, you, you try to take on one of these. Um, I'm, last year, I don't know if Liz is here, Liz Broderick, but Liz last year did a pretty good job of identifying um, gallerina. Uh, I think it's called Tibby cystis or something. Anyway, the, but but um, so these guys, I, I looked at a lot of things: spores, um, cystidia on the gills, cystidia on the gill edge, cystidia on the gill face. Which uh, there were no cystidia on the gill face. That was a key feature, actually. Cystidia on the on the stock, um, but there's a whole lot of different species that look like these. And they're very small. These had no partial veil, as far as I can tell. But that's a problem with these little gallerina species because some of them have partial veil that is really ephemeral, is very much fleeting. It's if you don't see them when they're very 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 young, you would never know there's a partial veil. Although on these guys, I see no evidence of a partial veil uh, being left on the, on the stock. So, um, so I'm pretty sure I got this. The only feature that didn't match up, and I put this on um, Advanced Mushroom Identification, the Facebook page, and um, nobody has disagreed, nobody has confirmed. Um, I don't really expect a whole lot of confirmation because these, these guys are pretty difficult, but um, this is the gill edge. These are chylocystidium, a whole bunch of them, variable um, shapes, um, uh, some like bowling pins, some are just like clubs, um, some are uh, what they call subcapitate. Subcapitate means almost forming uh, a head, like there's one here in the sort of the lower left that's in the background a little bit. Um, it's got like sort of a head. Um, these are chylocystidia, they're on the gill edge. I found no cystidia on the gill face. Um, those would be pleural cystidia. Now these cystidia right here were on the, on the stock. These are um, cholocystidia. The one thing that doesn't key out is um, Sing Smith and Singer say that uh, Valerina subserina has cholocystidia on the entire stock. Now, I only found uh, one little bunch near the apex. Now, possibly, maybe when I was harvesting them, I handled them, you know, got my fingers on the stocks, and maybe I crushed the 
call us a studio. I don't really know. But that's the only thing that doesn't key out. Everything else matches. And the last photo that you're that you're gonna see here is one of the is one of the key ones. Not not, not so much this that this one. Okay, so look at these little flaps on the spores. Those are um oh cal caliptrata. The, these spores are caliptrate. So the spores have this like sheath over them and they shed this sheath and but some of the sheath remains um, on the spore and forms these little like wings on the one end. Those are so these spores are called caliptrate because they have these little ornament ornamentation uh, these little wings. And that turned out to be a really key feature. Another feature here in the upper left, this spore right here, you see there's like a dugout uh, portion on the upper left part of the spore. That's a plague. Now, if you have a better microscope and you're doing oil immersion at 1000 uh, magnification, you're going to see um, more detail associated with, with this thing called a P-L-A-G-E plague. A plage. I don't know. I'm not sure how to say it really, but and but um on the lower right also you see see where the one part is dug out there. There's like a crescent shaped dugout. That's a plague. A lot of gallerina spores have a plague. Some have more prominent plague than others. The spore size that I got when I measured these uh, uh, um, matches very well with subserina. Um, so. I, I think I pretty much got this one identified. And so I've been working on trying to figure out these little gallerinas for the last two or three years. And I think I finally got one. So to me, to me, that was that was a big sort of big reason to celebrate. <laughs> but um, uh, certainly you don't take these things home and eat them, right? They're pretty small anyway, but maybe big enough to kill you if uh, they're like gallerina marginata. Anyway. Moving on to the next thing. Oh, this is pretty cool. So Virginia, are you here? I've got a slime mold. And I think this is one particular slime mold that you can just get by the way it looks. In particular- It's not a slime mold. What's that? It's not a slime mold, it's an, an imperfect fungi. It's the anamorph of some pesiza. That's not a slime mold? Nope. Virginia, are you here? It doesn't look familiar. I'm pretty sure this is a slime mold. It's Chromelosporium coeruleum. Um, yeah. It's the anamorph of a pesiza. Yeah. Really? Yes. And well, OK, more, you fooled me with others. that one. Do you have um, anything that you put under the microscope? No, I didn't, because I thought, um, I, I thought this was a slam dunk. Uh. <laughs> Uh, I, because I was... it's a blue slime mold. How many of those are there? But um, well, uh, okay. Maybe... Look, traditionally oh, this blue. was treated as a slime mold. I mean, maybe there's some sort of thing that that now is understood about it. Dave, I don't. I know don't know you... about this, um, Maricel. Look at I the do, way it's I growing. Do. Some I of do. it's on a leaf. Some of it's on a twig. I yeah. mean, this is spreading yeah. like a slime. It almost, yeah, it almost looks like it crawled over it and, and fruited, but I mean, it's not familiar. I would, I would have to see it, uh, on, you know, more under a, at least a dissecting microscope, and look at the spores. It doesn't. Ceridio mixa would be whiter than that, wouldn't? No, be, this it, is not Ceridio mixa. No. No, I know, I know that. Okay. Dave. And yes. I don't know you have good memory, but one time I found Chromelosporium carneum. It's kind of pinkish, and it was growing under uh, a boot, a leather boot that I found in the woods in the Pine Barrens. Oh, the okay. Same idea, but it was carneum. Okay, well, okay, species. okay. Look, let, let's just say this: um, that this is this is then motivation for me to do a little research on on this particular uh, genus and species. And and come you know and see what I come up with. I uh, have one more idea, Dave. There is one yeah. that is very common. It's called pit uh, fungus. It grows on dirt, on hummus, and it's white and it matures to 
cream yellowish color. It's yeah, that's not this. I, I think I know what you're talking volume. about. You see it on paths all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's very common. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's not this. Is that no, 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 no. I am trying to make you oh. act like aware of what this. Oh, okay. Go is. ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Continue. yeah. Continue. So there are few, few of them. Yeah. Oh, I see. So there's a few yeah. of these. Blue anamorphs. Uh, yes, they are asexual stages of Pesaisa species. Oh, wow. Well, they could have fooled me. I would have never guessed that. So, okay, I'll do some research on that. Well, I'm glad I, I brought it up then. Maybe I'll learn something. Dave, so where'd, you, where'd you get this name, Dave? The name, proposed name. Oh, you know what? When we were doing research for uh, a nymph in 2018, the 2019 nymph, um, John and Nina and I were... Uh, we're checking out a potential spot that we ended up not using really. And, and this was found, I mean, not this particular one, but pretty much the same thing. And um, one of us, I think maybe Nina, you know, said like, oh, you know, she knew it. She, she knew the species name. And, um, and so, I, so I, I recorded it, put it in my records. And I just went back into my records from 2018 because I remembered, you know, that we had found the same thing back then and just, you know, copied and pasted the name out of um, my records from back then. And so, so I, I don't honestly know what reference, um, what, you know, sort of official reference to use for this. Okay, well, because Chromalosporium is not, definitely not a slime mold. No, it's, it's it's definitely a uh, ASCO. I'm, I'm, oh. looking at, I'm looking at pictures oh, of it. Wait, it, I'm sorry. Okay, wait. You know what? Okay, you know what? I think I think I know what happened. They and and you know I think I know what happened. All right, I probably misspelled the name either back in 2018 or or now, and there's probably like two letters that are different. That's that is my guess. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a correction. Nobody corrected me on Muslim <laughs> Observer though. No, I think you're right, Dave. I think I think you have the right species. I'm looking at pictures of this. Oh, the Dave, All we right. have found this one in many forays, in hmm. Stokes, in 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 Teeter Town. I remember in it likes like old wood like very very disintegrated wood at the yeah, base yeah, of trees yes pretty much what it was all and, right okay i yield and, and, i yield and, <laughs> a call to do some research thank you i'll say and to add to that i've actually seen a few pictures of this on the philadelphia mycology club's facebook page like people were seeing this you know within the past couple of weeks around here in philadelphia so it would make sense that you'd be seeing it too right Okay, good, thanks. Oh, here you go, Marisol. I, I, I did not go to my Lunulato Spora spot, but Karen told me she wanted to go for a hike one day when I needed to mow the lawn and and she told me where she was going and it was very close to the spot. So I asked her to get some of these for me and she did. <laughs> and I've got a, and these look just like Mitrilla elegans that I showed like last week. But if you move ahead to the very last picture, so we don't, we don't need to see all, all the, oh, and by the way, Marisol, the, the, um, uh, the ask I were not, were not pinched. The what? ask I were not pinched on these, and I mounted in both Congo red, oh, oh, and, oh yeah, yeah. and and diluted um, cotton blue and full strength cotton blue just to see because I thought maybe I had a, an idea about the pinching of the ask I. I mm -hmm. thought maybe it was because if they were mounted in cotton blue, which is very thick, maybe maybe it would cause um, the the wall of the ascus to to collapse. But this this, this <laughs> okay. hypothesis turned out to not be supported. Yes. So we're, we're we're back to suggesting that what you have found in the pine barrens is is a, continues to be of 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 great interest, you know, in terms of that one 
um, mm -hmm. a microscopic difference. But look at these guys. Look at look at these spores. Boy, these are really crescent shaped. So there you go. Lunulata spora, named for the shape of the spores, crescent moons. So and and um uh, John and Nina had mentioned to me that they thought there was a correlation between um, habitat and species. And, and so the, the elegans that I found um, is, have been in hemlock pine areas with maybe a few hardwoods thrown in. These Lunulatospora uh, fruit bodies were collected in an area where there are absolutely no conifers. It's all hardwoods, maple, whatever's left of the ash, beech, birch. Um, so it's on, this is definitely just on hardwood litter. These, these are growing. So in water as usual. Okay. If, if, if you want to keep going, you know, if there's enough time, there's got a couple other ones here. Um, oh, there we go. The, the Neofabulus. So I found on my property, I think, just yesterday, or the, yeah, yesterday, um, this Neofalvalus, which is very pale, unlike the one that, uh, uh, is it Herve or Herve? I'm sorry, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but um, that showed late, earlier. So this one, maybe it's just faded. I don't know. Or maybe it is, um, um, you know, a, just pale. Uh, you don't get a whole lot out of the spore size here. Uh, they're, they're not that different one species to the other. Um, but the one thing that, that made me think this could be this other species, um, uh, um, Americana, Neofabulus Americana, the pores are really large. Now, once again, maybe that's due to age. Maybe that's because this has been around for a little while and this is completely expanded and the pores are pretty much as big as they're gonna be. Uh, but I saved it. I tried it out and saved it. You know, if somebody's interested, um, they can have it. Okay, so the hexagon poured polypore or at least one of the species grouped under that name. So what else do we have here? Oh, here we go. So a couple of years ago, my, my knee was really screwed up. I needed to have uh, arthroscopic surgery. And during the late spring and early summer, it was really hurting me. And I wasn't able to go out in the woods and walk very far. So instead of walking through the woods, I, I concentrated on looking for mushrooms within like, you know, a, a hundred yard radius of my back porch. And so I ended up examining this area in, in very much Maricel-like fashion, um, the, the, the looking for every tiny little detail I could spot. Um, and I found this little area where there's a lot of woody debris and hickory nut husks and leaves and so forth. And I found several different like LBM type things and posted some on Mushroom Observer. And um, I'm pretty sure, you know, with some help from some other people, um, I've managed to identify this, these little guys as um, Deconica phylogena. Although if you look on um, Champignon du Québec, the, the Quebec uh, mushroom site, they list another species, um, Deconica rhomboloida spora, I think it's called, I think I proposed it here, Rom rhombo, rhomboloida spora. Um, and <sighs> When you read the descriptions, <laughs> doesn't seem a whole lot different to me one from the other. So I'm wondering, you know, is there really a difference? Um, so because of there being some potential interest, um, I dried out a few of these little guys and they're bagged up and labeled. And if anybody is ever interested, I have them. So, but uh, partial veil, stringy, uh, fibrillose partial veil. Um, this is a really small button here. Um, and you know what? We just had a lot of rain. So we are talking about the weather before. Um, we had 2.5 inches of rain in an hour in my front yard because I have a gauge out there. 
and um, the rain just stopped now, we got more. So I should be finding mushrooms on my property now for the next few days. But you see how the cap has changed here? See how now the cap has this, this relatively um, wide, very pale beige-like annulus, annular area on it? Uh, this is a, a function of what, what is called being hygrophonous. Hygrophonous means the color changes as the mushroom loses or gains moisture. Usually it refers to the former, losing moisture. And in this case, that's what's going on here. This more or less brown or reddish brown mushroom, as it loses moisture, the color of the cap changes to a much lighter color. So this was a few after hours after I, I, I picked it. And the spores are really kind of interesting uh, for these guys. Um, depending upon how the spore is lying down, it, the shape is different. So, so that the profile matters. Sometimes um, you can call the spore subrhomboid. Uh, let's see if we can find a subrhomboid one here. Oh, right in the right there. there stop right in the middle. Sub, see, it's like a rhombus. Um, those of you who who um, um, didn't forget your um, um, sixth grade mathematics lessons uh, might recall that a rhombus is a four-sided polygon with two pairs of parallel sides, um, and the sides are all equal length. And so this spore right in the middle here is pretty close to being a rhombus. Okay, now of course it doesn't make um, the, there's no like actual vertex points, right? But but it's but it's it's like a, a smoothed out rhombus. On the other hand, look to the right. Look to the right. You you see here a more or less elliptical spore. It looks like an ellipse with maybe a little point on the end, and maybe somewhat truncate, um, meaning there's a, there's a pore on the end. So it sort of looks like it's cut off. So this is actually an a, a feature of identifying this particular species. On the other hand, this species Deconica rhomboidospora, rhom, rhomboidospora, um, also has, you know, subrhomboid spores. So I don't know. Is there a difference? I don't know. These are the Chylocystidia, the picture just shown here. They're, you can see they're. They're sort of, sort of um, thickened at the base. It's sort of like thickened and tapered to the apex. The picture is not great. I, I took a whole lot of pictures, and this was pretty much the best one I got. Um, the the apices, plural of apex, is um, sometimes it's sub what we call subacute, meaning it almost comes to a point, or maybe subcapitate. Um, which this one right in the middle here to the lower part of the middle is, I would say, I would call that subcap because it's almost got like a little swelling at the apex, like a head. Um, but filamentous, uh, sometimes they'll call um, cystidia like this filamentous because they're very thin. They're, they're almost like filaments. Some of them are kind of like that. It's, it's a little bit difficult to assess these chylocystidia because a fair amount of, of what constitutes one of them is stuck inside um, the gill context. So you, you're not seeing really the whole things here. Um, but that fits. All of these things fit to conica phylogenum. Um, the dimensions of the spores fit pretty well. Um, and I've been finding this the last, like, well, since um, 2019 when I was unable to walk much more than 50 yards without my knees hurting. So <laughs> that was, I guess, some sort of silver lining as I learned some new, interesting, tiny mushrooms. Uh, oh, one last thing very quickly. Dorothy, Dorothy mentioned last week that um, um, Rhizomerasmus pyrocephalus has interesting uh, pymenial cystidium. Okay, I had forgotten about that. Um, so I went out in the yard and 
Well, actually, after the we had our Zoom thing last Tuesday, I went out in the yard with a flashlight, and I actually couldn't find any of them. But the next morning, I went out again and collected a few. These are all old photos. Ah, but there's a new photo, and there they are, the interesting hymenial cystidia. These are capitate, subcapitate to capitate, meaning these guys don't just kind of have a head. Uh, they have a head, okay? So, um, <laughs> so they're kind of like clave capitate. And now what? what else is there are they are they subfusoid meaning are they tapered on both ends well it's hard to tell because the one end is buried in the gill but uh, but they are interesting um hymenial cystidia and there's quite a few of them um if you scope a, a gill of of this species you're you're apt to find a fair number of of these little guys so okay that's all i have tonight thank you any questions <laughs> Thanks for all the the info. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so yeah, uh, I was uh, in a few places this week, but I got a couple of good pictures. We were talking about a grassy, maybe last week. That would be as close as I would come with this. Looks like leaves, but it was basically a wood chip path, fairly recent wood chips. But a grass, a grass bees are kind of boring, beige brown, little rounded knob and top. Um, also displaying what Dave just described, the hygrophanous, hygrophanous change of color when moisture um, loses or gains in the cap. Nice light brown spore print. Little bit of evidence of a ring in the middle here on the, the one in the center. I'm, <laughs> I'm not good enough with a microscope to try and figure out what species they are, but I always like to uh, at least recognize the genus when I see it. Um, what's the next one, Luke? Oh, um, also uh, uh, Susan. The um, I think that those were probably had a had a partial veil, because right. you can see there's you can like see an that. annular region collapsed mm -hmm. onto the stalks, yeah, and that's very likely ring. due to there having been a partial veil. And right. so did did I would say something in the complex, generally referred to as a grassy precox, which which basically means you know the um, spring grassy. You know, I'm looking at this picture that now Luke has zoomed in close. I never noticed that they have a slightly serrate edge to the gills. I'll have to oh. look more. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't even looking at that. One, but, huh? Yeah. I wasn't looking at that. I was looking at... Yeah, the, oh, I, 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 I saw the ring when I, you know, yeah. picture. Um, and also it reflects the color of the spores. But that's kind of interesting that with... It's a good enough picture that it shows a little slightly serrated edge of the gills. Yeah, that's a that's a really good picture, actually. Yeah, I'm surprised at that. Yeah, this was down in Blue Mountain Lake at the Adirondack Museum Trail. But actually, I've seen a grass be in several places. So it, you know, it's a sort of a big LBM, a big little brown mushroom. And the next one it looks a lot similar, but it isn't. It, obviously, the spore color is much different with the pink. Um, I called this Entoloma vernum um, with, again, kind of a knobby top, light brown, kind of a stringy stem, but um, the pink gills are, are very distinctive. And also the time of year for um, um, a spring Entoloma vernum kind of mushroom. I don't know if that's actually correct, but I, I, it's as close as I'm going to get. I've seen yeah, it's considered to be a group. Yeah, I'm sure. So, I'm yeah, sure. you know that makes sense to me. Put it put it into that group. There's so many entolomas, and I, really, I I think they're not all that well understood. Really, yeah. uh, actually, if you talk to um, Baroni, though, you know if you know. Um, yeah, but he's off the deep end on pink sport stuff. You know, he yeah. would 
person to consult if I really wanted to. Yeah, you would need you would need like a lots of arcane details, I suppose. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like the guy a lot, but <laughs> it's more work than I want to do. Except that I find a lot of Leptonias here in the middle of the summer, and I always think of him when I see them. I usually see about four species at a time. Okay, what? Um, I've had that experience in the Adirondacks as well with the Leptonias. Um, yeah, you get a bunch, a bunch of, the of them. The gills are the gill attachments are, are different. This I had to take about four times to get a picture that was almost in focus for the gills. I think it was because the lighting was a little bit strange, but I was calling this Gallerina mar marginata, um, small on a well rotted stump. Um, you can't see it very well, but there is a little tiny um, ring at the top of the stem there. Um, and I'm sure it, these are very young, but I'm sure it would be a, a dark spore print. One thing you might want to consider, although I agree, these look more like Galleran and Marginatum, um, but Coenomyces marginalis also we, we have a whole lot of it down here right now in, in Pennsylvania. And it's pretty easily confused with Gallerina marginata. Um, these look more like Gallerina to me, though. These, like, nicely convex semi- The one you, the one you just mentioned, the Coonoromyces, what kind of a habitat is that? This is on- Wood. Wood, woody debris, sometimes yeah, right on logs. Deciduous or conifer? I think it's not very picky. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty much any kind of wood. This, if I I'm not sure though. Was a uh, conifer stump. Although this particular trail had a nice mixture of more uh, yellow birch and beech. This looks more like Gallerina to me. There's a few, the stem also looks. I don't. You know, sometimes it's hard to pinpoint exactly. Stems were definitely traits. a little darker at the bottom. And also a little bit stringy looking. Yeah, it's just, I, I, you might just want to check out that species just yeah, for the yeah. sake of doing a comparison for your own. Uh, you might not even get it up there in the Adirondacks. I don't know. It might yeah, that's be. what I'm thinking. I'm, yeah. I, I'm... But they can be tricky to tell apart. And oh, it used to be Foliota varus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was the old name. So some of the older field guides are going to call it. Foliota veris, and now it's Coenomyces marginalis. But these look more like Gallerina to me, though. These nicely convex, uniformly like semi globular. Um, well, and I, um, yeah, I would also expect them to be a little darker, but these I think were so young. That these are a little bit lighter than usual, but they still yeah. look more like Gallerina to me. I agree. Okay, there's another one in this. I've never seen Galarina grow so gregariously. They do look pale, and I think Galarina has a much larger ring, and it's also darker. Well, so I would think it's, I would think it's the marginalis. You think that's marginalis? I don't I think, think it is. But the only, the one way you can tell is by looking at the spores. Yeah, these were too young for spores. I think. I don't see. I don't see a ring that you see in the. Galarina. Yeah, um, it's not a, yeah, the picture isn't really good enough, but it's right at the top of the stem. Well, Galarina has it actually lower, and yeah, it's always yeah. brown. You know, the whole mushroom is more brown than this kind of a tan color. Yeah, the yeah, partial you know, veil is white, though, on Galarina marginatum. The what? Partial veil is white. The ring uh, turns brown from the spores. Yeah, well, maybe, but uh, I guess, <laughs> uh, you know, I've seen that Gallerina, and I've never seen such a gregarious growth of Gallerina. Really? Uh, Up here, I some one time I saw thousands of them in a wood chip mulch, oh. and it was spring. I keep going by that site to see if they still come up, but they only were really that one time in that spot. But Susan, if you want, to, if you want to pull your microscope out of the mothballs and, oh, and examine one. a spore print, it's it's. <laughs> It's you can tell the difference really at 400 magnification between Galerina mar marginatum, mar marginata, and um, Coenomyces marginalis. The spores are quite a bit different. 
Well, I've got it out, so I may do that. Um, the next picture, this is how the it was a log that was down. And what's interesting here to me is that these fruit bodies were actually from last year. They haven't changed direction yet to, to face the pore surface down, but they're putting out a new layer of growth on the underneath with the, the very purplish edge, um, Tricaptum biformi. And uh, I just thought they were so pretty. And, and very, it's way too early for anything really new to grow, and especially that big in the way of little polypores everywhere, although that is a fairly common mushroom up here. But that's how the log was down, and that had been how they were growing last year when the log was undoubtedly, the tree was still standing. So what I expect here is that they will change direction if they come out eventually. Anyway, I thought it was kind of pretty, the color. Um, and then the, the next email, I have two polypores. And then, all right, so this, these are also from very much from last year. These are the Ganoderma tsugi on a hemlock log. And uh, I could see them 50 feet away. They were that bright in the woods which was mostly a deciduous woods, but a few big hemlocks. Uh, they still look pretty good for being last year's. And they were, all of those are bigger than my hand. Uh, and then the next polypore, I'm calling Philinus ignarius. This was on a beech tree. And what's, you can see at least three years of growth here. What's interesting here is about three years ago, the Paul Smith student whacked this off the tree. It's right on the path. And uh, I was surprised that this thing has recovered as well as it has. A very thick lip, light brown, new growth coming out, new layer of tubes. Um, but it's a pretty mushroom, even though it's kind of a boring one. We get a lot of variations of Ignarius. And that was a question I was going to ask Gary Linkoff. He passed away about whether the same mushroom, the same species could be on various trees. Most of the felinus are broken up by according to the species of trees that they grow on. And then the next two are the last hurrahs of the same sarcosomas, my little jello shots. The next, yeah, this is the one I showed last week, one of them that I showed a series of five. The lighting was poor. Um, so I, I couldn't get it quite at the same angle, but but this this one on the left is completely collapsed, and the one on the right is hardly it may shriveled up almost to nothing. Both of them very black now. I, I don't think I'll go in again because they're so ugly and they're so so defunct now that it's too defunct. sad turning into blobs or potato chips. And then the next one is even worse looking compared to how beautiful they were, the, the group of three, that it's almost right next to this first clump, but they really look like, you know, squashed and done as it were. But we've had enough wet that they haven't totally dried up, which I think is interesting. I didn't show a picture of one that's totally become a bowl. A lot of them have sunk entirely and become just hollowed out little bowls with just a, a, a skin of leather sort of showing, but that's, all there is. Now I just noticed somebody, uh, I don't know if they're still on board here, um, about a Connecticut foray the end of August is the coma foray. Um, I think if you Google uh, Connecticut Westchester Mycological Association, you should come to their website that would list the um, coma foray information. Um, I have signed up for it as well as Dorothy. I don't know if you did, Luke. Um, no. But my wife and I are signed up. We're going. Yeah, it's a good foray. And um, a little expensive, but they have good collecting. It's a very good informal, maybe 70 people. Not a lot more than that. But it's the Connecticut Westchester Mycological Association, the coma. All right, cool. Thanks, Phil. All 
Okay, um, this is a uh, slime mold. This is from Kentucky and it's um, a moist chamber culture of Queen Anne's lace dead flower tops from, from last year. It was out in the field when Easter weekend when I went there. Um, yeah, so it has a long, uh, a thin stalk tapered toward the top and uh, like an almost global uh, for uh, spore bearing spore theca on the top. So next picture, that's another picture um, covered with limey, with lime. So you know it's Fissarelli's right away because of the lime. Okay, the next one. Because of the what, Virginia? Lime, calcium carbonate. Um, everything with lime in it belongs to the huh. class order, order Fissarelli's. Uh huh. Okay. So, so in, is this growing on the stem of the Queen Anne's it's going on? Um, probably a stem or yeah okay yeah you know what queen anne's lace looks like um yeah, and this flower head somewhere on there i kind of broke it up to put in the uh moist chamber so this shows the bottom part um of the the spore head the spore theca, that it's um sort of flat and a little pale uh, brownish colored uh it's it's not umbilicate which some other species can be. So, okay, the next one. How, how large are the are these fruit bodies? Oh. Or how small, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Um, a millimeter or two, a couple millimeters. Wow. That was under a uh, dissecting microscope. You can oh, I was, well, that was going to be my next question. How did you yeah. manage to get those really good pictures of such Alert, low battery. Oh, low battery. Just a minute. Got to plug in. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you have to, you could barely see them. If you really look closely, you might see them. But otherwise, you really have to, you have to scan your, your Petri dish um, or, or whatever you have it in. You put it under the dissecting microscope and kind of scan around and see what you can see. <laughs> Okay, and this is uh, one I put on, under the, um, on a slide, uh, just to kind of spread it out. The, the, the head is all squashed now. So, okay, the next picture. And now I just took a picture of the stalk just so that it's fibrous, which doesn't really matter one way or the other. It, it doesn't have any line in the stalk. Okay, the next picture. Okay, the, these are the spores and the lime granules. As you can see, the lime granules, uh, they're called granular. They're not um, crystalline because if you had pointy star-shaped lime, um, that would be a different genus. But these uh, granular um, Lime is, you know, was one of the features that you have to look for. And there's a few little bits of capillitium, but not much. Um, this species really should have more of the strands, the capillitium, but I think it's probably because it was done in a moist culture. Sometimes they don't always form everything that they should. Uh, these are brown spores that are round, fairly, you know, round and fairly smooth. They're not. Um, they don't have a lot of uh, spines on them. What, what, what are the spores mounted in? Water. Usually uh, water. Okay. Sometimes I put a little, um, uh, well, alcohol, I guess, to help get the air bubbles out. But KOH is supposed to, you know, to make them swell up a little bit. But most of the time I get lazy and I just use water. <laughs> Well, actually, that, that's good to know, because if they swell up a little bit, you might not get the best reading on uh, dimensions. Yeah. Well, these are 10 microns. They were all about uh, the same 10 microns, which fits in with the species. And there's hatches of 
the lime, the granular lime, which probably came from the surface. Now this particular species should have, um, if it had capillitium, it should have what's called lime nodes in it, but I didn't really see any, but there, most of that lime was probably on the surface. Uh, when I've used KOH, I don't, I've never really seen any big difference in the size of the spores. Um, this is under uh, oil, th this particular picture right here. So anyway, it's, I uh, came up with Fissorum album as a species. So, um, awesome. the only one I had. Oh, cool. any question? I didn't take a picture of the whole um, container to show, the, you know, like that you could see that it was really Queen Anne's lace. And actually I found another, there was another slime mold on there, which I didn't get to identify in the same uh, moist chamber. Sometimes you get two or three in one. Oh, cool. Um, Any questions for anybody? Great picture of the spores. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Virginia. Okay, Marisol. Okay, Are you there, Marisol? Yeah, I am. I am. Hello. Okay. I was just trying to make the, the image bigger, but it won't work. How do I hide the chat? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so I went to Franklin Parker, just to the area near the railroad and the creek. And um, at the edge of the swamp, there were some branches on the moss. And I found Michenera artocreas, which is... Um, it's a crust and it, grow, it could grow both forms at the same time. So underneath the branch, you see the proper crust on top of the branch. And you can see it here in this photo is the asexual stage, which used to be called Lycrostroma subgiganteum. You'll see the photo. So the cross underneath and the asexual stage on top of the branch. It's like a maple, swamp maple, something like that. Can you pass? So that's the asexual stage. Uh, it, I forgot to collect the one from the top, the asexual stage. And these conidios pores are humongous and brown. Uh, they come from that brownish, reddish, uh, Bar inside the cups, like if I can say that. Can you pass? The spores are humongous and they are from globos to subglobos. And, and I got this one as, from a spore print, which is white. And I don't know why they were immature, even that the, the cross dropped the spores. So when they are mature, they have this, this giant drop. They also have a, a very um, prominent apiculus, which is very shy. I do not know why it's so hard to see it. Can you pass the photos? Oh, and so the flesh of this cross is so tough. It's made out of dendroifidia, which is tangled going in all directions. I couldn't see the basidia because it was too much with this dendroifidia. It's like branch, branch hypha. So here I use uh, fluoxine and I got one spore to show you the apiculus and the big drop inside. And another one, but the apiculus is on the other side, but you can still see the spot where it is. And the, the spores are so big. Let me tell you how big they are. If I can find the paper. 
the stiff print. No, I can't find it. I'm working in medium pieces of paper at the same time. I can't, it's too much. I can't, but they are humongous, really big and beautiful. And this crust has gloiosis tibia, which is immersed in the flex, in the flesh. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, in the context. Can you pass? I couldn't get a better uh, photo of that. So this is like a high resolution, but you can see the cystidia. It has, it's colored and is immersed in the context and it's below the basidia layer, which is towards the upper part of this photo where you can see all these spheres, which are the, the spores. Boy, my, my guess is that's as good as it gets for um, show, showing these guys that are immersed in the context. Uh, oh, oh, no, I found it at Jerry Go and I did the micro, but I had a better microscope. I had an Olympus that belongs to the club. But oh, so, I, oh, yeah. I see. So you, you actually saw them yeah, before. more prominently than this? No, this year I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I could oh. only take a photo like that. When I came closer, I couldn't do it. They were behind the dendroifidia. I, I oh. cut the slice too thick. That's what happened too. But you can get an idea of what I am trying to say. Everything in this cross is giant. The glycistidia is really big. The basidia is really big. And the spores are humongous. And it's fun. I love it. So, so are these spores, are they like, are they bigger than like 20 microns? Let me find the paper. Let me find the paper. A date, 25, 529, 529. I found the paper. Where's the paper? 529. No, Paquito spore. No, I can't find the paper. I can't, too tricky. No, I can't find it, it's too much. Sorry, I can't tell you, I don't remember. I, but it's in, my, in my, it's in my observation. If you get out of the photos, the, below the photos, there is the information. I forgot about that. Oh. It says there, 18, up to 18.5. Okay, well that, that's really big for Globo spores, mm -hmm, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm good. Okay, so this is really funny, Dave, because when the last time I, I went to find the mitrula, the mitrulas, I only found lunulatospora. I did like seven samples. And this time I went and I found elegance. I found it. And I remember that I said before, I read this in one book, that somehow maybe it's here in this area. Mitrula lunulatospora comes earlier. And then later comes uh, elegance. So, and I made the micro and yeah, it is elegant. You'll see the spores. Can you show the spores, please? It's completely different to Lunulatospora. Like a cucumber, kind of seedless cucumber. You can show more, please. I got more spores. Thank you. And some of them were so long. The, one, the ones on the right side. So, so I'm guessing the the ascii that you found here were not didn't have the pinched um, oh no but the yeah. pinched one were lunulatospora right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i'm just mm -hmm. yeah i'm yeah. just verifying that yeah so. i'll keep an eye on these things yeah yeah there's there's no none of them have the moon shape here no, so no, this is the yeah what was the habitat for these in the pine barrens in okay pine same barrens. habitat the All same right. place where we always find them yeah And um, so 
I went to check the spot in the park near me in Smithville for Mitrula Lunulatospora, and I found it. I found one. And when I was doing this, I know where mm, Flebiopsis crassa grows. So I went and I found it. Mm, so the photo's pretty bad, but I wanted to do the micro totally about this one because it's so interesting, it's so beautiful. I got the spore print and I got the, when you look at this crossed with um, a lens, you can see, uh, no, here is Basidia on the top part of, um, of the photo and it's growing like, it's almost like Pleurobasidia, which means that the Basidia grows laterally. You can see the sections. I put some three arrows in there. Uh -huh. So you can see the different basidia growing like in a row from a horizontal hypha, hypha, hypha. Mm -hmm. And then I show you the other elements that are so beautiful. It's Lamprocystidia or Skeletocystidia. Mm, it, because it's very long and it comes from the, from the base of the crust. So this is what is exerted what is sticking beyond the basidia that you can see there. And, and I, you can see some basidia on the top and the lamprocystidia greenish below. And uh, this is, I couldn't put this in a photo that we could see clearly, but this is the base of that skeletocystidia. It goes all the way down. So see how long it is. It keeps going and it has also some incrustations. And here is one that was cut, but I wanted to show you how thick the walls are and the incrustations. And I was reading in Rivarden's book about stereo steroid fungi because he puts this one there not that it belongs to that class. Mm, and he says that when the, this fruiting body that I found is very young. So some of the uh, cystidia had incrustations and some didn't have them yet, didn't develop them yet. Oh, and this is in water. Um, and I, I was, it has this kind of brownish lavender color because the cross is, when it's young, is purplish lila, purplish, and when it's mature, it turns almost to a brown color. Actually, the tone is right there to the upper left. When it's mature, it has the brownish uh -huh, tone, yep. I don't know what happened with that observation, but that's a good one. Maybe, can we do the, can we do it? The tridentaria is pretty good. I don't know what happened there. Wonderful. So when I went to Winona like two weeks ago, I found a, an abandoned pine plank in a, wet, in a very wet area and it had a crust, a white creamy crust. And actually, when I did the microscopy, there were three things growing together there. So there was the white cross, which I could not identify, and the spores are right there, the bigger ones with the two drops, one and two drops. And then there was an, um, a hypomyces uh, growing on the crust, which are the little round pea-like spores. Look, can you point to what I am saying? No, no, in this first photo, the, yeah. There are these little tiny pea-like uh, spores. They belong to hypocria, no hypomyces, hypocria or tricoloma, which has an ascus that has 16 spores. And they look like peas, green peas. So I got, this, I got three spores here, the spores from the cross, the spores from hypocria or trichoderma, and those are, Ingels jewels, the hypomycetes, which grow in wet spots, in, in a spot where the, the gutter drains the rainwater, 
spots like that. So I didn't know what they were. So I put them in, in Asco, my cities of North America. And Diango Grudmeyers, he told me that looks like Ingalls jewels. And it's called Tridentaria. And you can see why, three teeth, yeah? Tridentaria. And, but even in this photo, there is one with four uh, teeth, but in general, they all have three teeth, but I couldn't narrow to the species. I tried and it was too tricky. Um, yeah, and they were huge, the, these spores. Can you show the other photos? I use fluoxin and I don't know why some areas stain and some areas don't stain. And in this photo, you can see a baby of these spores, tridentaria to the right left, and you can see an older one uh, to the lower right, which has developed into pointy shape and segments. It divides in like six, eight segments. Can you show more, please? More of the same, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's a baby one. It has three, but I couldn't focus on the third one. It, it didn't focus because it's three-dimensional. Here, one older one and one younger one. And they are mixed with the spores from trichoderma and from the crust. It was a lot of fun this, to find these things. I don't know what relation this one had, but I found it with the Tridentaria. I don't really know too much about it. It looks like a bird's foot. <laughs> oh, this one has four teeth. But it, yeah, in general, more had three than four. And that's the cross, that's the white cross, but it's completely parasitized by hypocrea. And this tridentaria was growing somewhere there. When I was putting this cross to drop the spores, in one place around the cross, there were these tridentaria spores. It's an abandoned pine plant. Super tiny, this is a very small fruiting body. And I show you one of, uh, I made two observations about this um, Scutellinia. And now um, Malcolm Greaves, which is from England, he, I think he's from England. He told me that this is Scutellinia Patagonica. I'm not sure that I showed this uh, last week, but now it has a name, Scutellinia Patagonica. The, the setae is very short. No, no, no se tie. I don't know how they call it. The hairs are very short. It's 1.5 millimeters long. They have double walls, uh, septa, and the base of the hairs is simple, but also I found four ones. I don't know if it is called Patagonica because they found it first in Patagonia, in Argentina, probably. Identify it there first. And you see that the paraphyses stick beyond the axis really a lot. And ornamentation is very important for scutellinias. You don't show photos of ornamentation. Can you show the last photo? No ID because some of them form reticulations and some of them don't blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks, Michelle. Right. You're welcome. You do, I think that was everything that I had. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, everyone who sent stuff in and shared already. Um, we have a few minutes left. Is there anybody that has anything left that they would like to share? If there's time, I have two that I found yesterday. Yeah, got a few minutes. Right ahead. 
Okay, let me get it open. Oops, wrong one. Uh, Luke, you just sent out that email about Friday night. I would highly recommend anybody to listen in on Brandon Matheny. He's one of our top DNA guys. So even if Inasavi is kind of boring, he's done a lot of work in sorting out systemics and names. What's related to what? Yes, I'll make sure I announce that before we're all done. Can you see the photo? Yep. So this one I think is pretty obvious, at least even to a newbie, for it to be Monotropa uniflora. Monotropa, yeah. Success. <laughs> I named one. <laughs> so and yeah. it's not a fungus. You know that, right? It's a non-chlorophyll plant. Oh darn. I thought it was a mushroom flower. <laughs> no. Have you seen no, no, issue? no. But it's important to know that it's connected. It's a parasite between the, the, the tree that's doing the sugars and the Russell of genus. And somebody smarter than me can describe the rest of it. We need Gary. Oh, darn. All right. I don't know the species, but I know um, I was doing a little presentation about this monotropic. I can't remember the right name. Monotropic. What's the name? Monotropic? No, monotropa. 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 Okay, the group of these kind of uh, plants, there are 11 of these in, in US, and they have a relation with a mushroom and a tree, as uh, Susan says. And the reason why they don't uh, produce any chlorophyll is because they get their nutrients through this relationship. They parasitize the tree indirectly, right? Yeah, and they, they come in many colors. And uh, yeah, uh, that's good enough. But it's also- I think they specific. parasitize the fungus. And the fungus is in a mycorrhizal association with the tree because russulas are um, a, a symbiote with um, a certain or mycorrhizal. trees. They're mycorrhizal. Mycorrhizal, right. They, they have a symbiotic relationship. So, so um, I, I think that this, um, What's called sometimes, um, what, what do we call these things? Indian pipes or something? Indian, Indian pipes. pipes. Um, they're, I, I think they are parasitizing the fungus actually. So it's kind of, it's a three way thing. But, right. but I think that in particular, these things are getting their nutrients from the fungus, which is getting its nutrients from the tree. So how would I find that fungus then? Would I have to dig deeper underneath or is it the, the, um, Later on, there should be yeah. some russula mushrooms growing just, in the area. Yeah, just wait a few weeks and you'll see some mushrooms yeah. around probably. Okay, because this was a large patch. There was hundreds of these uh, flowers so have, or ghost flowers. So I, I'll have to look out for that. Thank you. Before All right. you go, can I tell you a little thing about them? These, these are incredible plants. They don't have leaves. And so they have these, I cannot remember brackets, I think the names of these little scaly things on the stems kind of part of the flower. And they, when they are younger, the flower is facing the floor, the ground. And as they mature, they end with the flower all the way up. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to okay. disperse the, the seeds that are really, really tiny. And some of these seeds have wings like Mm -hmm. It's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And there are yellow ones and red and orangey. And some have a smell that people detect them because of the smell. And some of these form like a big root under there. I mean, we not, we don't supposed to dig them out, but there is a, a big ball of something at the base of these flowers. Nice. So if I were to actually, for example, pick them to go into my garden, they probably wouldn't survive unless I got some no, of the- because, Yeah, because the relation the with the mushroom. Relationship, yes, got it. Okay, good to know. And thank you for that. I like all the information you guys are telling me. So let me see if I can share the next one after it. Can you see the one with my boot or no? No. We're still seeing the monotropa okay. flora. I'll stop that and reshare. 
All right, so no clue what this is. I have another picture that's a little closer. Uh, so this is just a size comparison. Uh, I have uh, a medium sized foot, seven and a half. So just for your... <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> All right, so that's that. I, I'm curious. Show the, show the close up. Yeah, working on it. Oh, that's not it. Next one. There we go. Here it comes. How about that? Oh, yeah. It's a slime mold. It's a slime mold. The Veronica, what's what that? Virginia. <laughs> Are you there? I don't, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I need to see it more closely. I can't, I have trouble with, I guess, seeing things unless they're under a dissecting microscope, but I'm not it, sure it does. It, is that any better? That's better. I mean, I don't know what it is. It could be a plasmodium that's just forming. It's uh -huh. not really formed, possibly it's good. It looks a little slimy along the edge. Yeah. And uh, I think there's an albino ant right next to it. Do you see this thing? Oh my yeah. goodness. I didn't even notice that before. <laughs> yes. Oh. Right offhand, I can't say what it is. <laughs> no problem. Uh, are you near Turkey Swamp Park? I can point it out to you. It's actually okay. pretty close. Or go back the next day and see if it's different. Sure, definitely. But there were a couple of them. Again, I, I, I'll go back to the one with my boot in it because there was several of those. Uh, not quite some as slimy as that one. Uh, there we go. And I will zoom in if I can. So yeah, the one that you guys saw is the one uh, at the bottom. Uh -huh. Can I zoom in anymore? Oh, close. Yeah, this one at the bottom, but it does have a couple of them uh, around the edges of this stump. Very similar. Let's see if I can get to the other one. Yeah, it looks like the starts of it is not, not quite slimy at the top here. Interesting. But yeah, that one was, oh, we have a very slimy reddish one. But that one, it just seemed so strange that it had these kind of like postules on it. Yeah. I'd have to see it more fully developed, but it could be, I don't know, it could be a um, But I'm not sure what color, see the plasmodium color uh, are different for different slime moles. And you have to wait till it's fully formed really to identify it. And I don't remember what the plasmodium color is for the tidiophilium, but the, it's like, the, if that's what it is, it's the different sporangia that are forming all close together, so close together that it looks like one big slime mold. And there's sort of like little caps on top, if that's what it is. I don't know what. Um, color. So what, how would I find out what color the, uh, what did you call it? The, the plasmodium is different yeah. colors, but that's what you need is a fully developed, mature slime mold to identify. You don't know. always need to know the color of the plasmodium. Okay, how do I know when it's fully developed? When it's dry. <laughs> dry. It look all e even, not, not quite so bubbly. They might, it might look like pustules all over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it should be dryish, not slimy anymore. Are you near central Jersey? I could hand it off to you if you like. I'm in Pennsylvania. Oh. oh <laughs> outside of Allentown. Okay, all right. If you go on, um, so if you, you'd have to go back to where you found it and try to collect it. It looks like on a stump and it might be hard to get a little bit of the substrate so that you could get it in one piece. Mm. You break off a piece of the wood with it on it. Would be mm -hmm. the thing. Okay. 
uh, when you see a plasmodium, when it's still in the slime stage, never bother to collect it because it, you know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> you usually have to flag it or something and go back the next day and see what it looks like when it's fully developed. This is actually pretty easy to find. It's right off of the parking lot. So no problem, I can find it. Yeah, if you can find it again, get another picture, at least if you can't collect it. If you try to collect it and the wood is hard, too hard, it'll probably crumble, but mm -hmm. you might be able to look, you know, at least look at the spores, see what color, and, you know, shape the spores are in. I don't personally have a microscope, I'm sorry. Oh, well, that's, a, for slime molds, I think, Unless it's something you can identify right off, you'd need a microscope. <laughs> yeah, okay. Identify without a problem, but a, a lot of them need a microscope. <laughs> no problem. Virginia, I'll keep taking photos of it as it develops. How's that? that, was, that was <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thanks, Bianca. Thank All right. So that brings us right up to about nine o'clock. So um, before we go, I did want to announce the uh, this, this Friday. Uh, June 11th at 7 p.m. We do have Brandon Matheny speaking for us. They, uh, his topic is a systematic overview of North American Nasibacea. So uh, this is actually the last of our lectures. We've been doing online lectures for the past year in conjunction with New York, and Eastern Penn, and a bunch of other mushroom clubs. This is the last of our online lecture series that we're doing. We're taking a break for the summer, everyone seems to be getting outside and everything. Things are opening back up, which is a great thing. Um, hopefully we'll be re restarting this in the fall. I, I, I hope so. Um, this collaboration, because we've been able to bring a lot of uh, really good speakers from all over the, uh, the country. And I think even some speakers from outside of the country on some stuff. So anyway, this Friday is our final um, lecture with Brandon Matheny. I hope everyone can attend. And of course, we'll be here next Tuesday. Right. All right. Everyone hey, have uh, a great night. I found my book. Um, Dictidiophilium has a bright, um, I lost it here, like a bright rose pink plasmodium. I mean, that's a possibility. And it will look more grayish when it's mature, <laughs> rather, lead, lead gray color. What's the name again? Dictidia athelium. Dictidia athelium. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if I can get it in there in time in the chat. That's okay. a, possib a possibility only. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Well, everyone have a great night. All right. I'm going to sign off. I'll see you next week. I'll leave it up for a minute if you want to type that into Virginia. My, I always have a problem typing on this computer. That's close. <laughs> it's not quite spelled right, but that's close. I don't know if that worked. There it goes.